Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll declare the meeting open. I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'll just wait for the people to come in through there. Thanks, guys. There's a few seats up the front and... Ladies and gentlemen, I'll declare the meeting open today and uh, we will start by the opening prayer if you'd like to stand or not for the opening prayer. Almighty God, we humbly ask thee to bless and guide this council in its deliberations so that we may truly preserve the welfare of the people whom we serve. Amen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to the elders of other communities who may not be with us today. Also, Clause 91.4 of the Government of the Governance and Meeting Conduct Local Law provides the following. This public meeting is being recorded to improve access to the meeting for our community. The recording will be retained by council in accordance with the council's legal obligation. As a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. Well, thank you for everyone for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to point out today, we have a number of issues that are controversial and they have been over the last X amount of months since planning applications were lodged. Council has to deliberate on these things. We, are, we receive um, uh, notices from people who are for the certain applications and we get notices of people who are against applications. I urge you to pay respect to all people on their applications and the grounds of their applications without any hoo-ha from the audience and loud and aggressive behaviour won't be tolerated. So please make your point clear in your questions in public question time and we urge you to put them and respect my fellow councillors here who have to deliberate on these issues and respect that they have made the decision after uh, receiving all bits and pieces from people over the, the, during the period that the applications were lodged. So thank you. Uh, we're all present and uh, we'll continue on for the confirmation of the previous minutes there. We have a move for Ashley, seconder, Harv uh, Harvey Benton. Just lost my spot. Sorry. I'll put it to the vote, confirmation of the minutes. Thank you. Uh, are there any conflicts of interest? David Fuller. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to declare a conflict of interest with 16 Queen Free due to a close working relationship uh, and paid position with one of the applicants. Thank you. Uh, are you happy to step out of the room during this uh, procedure, though? Thank you. Uh, receive petitions. I do have a petition. Now, this is a, a petition from a, a young lady around about the age of 12, 13, by Grace Jenkins at 349 Shanley Street, Wangaratta. Um, she is, uh, has a petition with a number of signatures here on it there that we can see filled out and it was to uh, help make our road a safer place. Uh, it was for Shanley Street to reduce the speed limit from 100 kilometres to 80 kilometres or lower. So this is her petition and Council is following this through and we'll bring this further through from there. So do we need a motion to accept this report? Uh, Harry Bussell, seconder Ken Clark. All those in favour? The motion's carried. Uh, no deputations. Presentation of council law reports, and I'll throw over to Ken for this. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. I would like um, this council to recognise the services of, of um, the late 
and Ed Jasper, who um, was the wife of Ken Jasper, 31 years as our Member of Parliament. Um, whilst Ken was never a, a minister in any any of the parliaments that he sat in, uh, he, um, he was able to get along with with all colours and um, we, we were very fortunate to have Ken here. Uh, in my previous term as a councillor, uh, Ken was a very supportive of this city of Wingarana and, uh, and I, I just think that Annette was such a pillar uh, of strength for Ken, looking after the family and doing things while Ken was absent. And I'd like a, a, a motion of condolence for Annette Jasper, please. Uh, motion and second is a motion. Harvey Benton. All those in favour of carrying that motion. I think the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for your kind words. Uh, we'll continue down into uh, officers' reports. We'll go to executive services. Thank you, Brendan McGowan. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, this item is to ask Council to appoint one of the councillors as our representative with the MAV. Uh, we are a member of the MAV as, as our peak body, the Munis Municipal Association of Victoria. The role of the representative is really to promote MAV activities, um, attend various strategic planning sessions and also represent council at the state council meetings that the MAV holds several times a year. And the recommendation is on the screen. Uh, can I have a mover of that? Uh, David Fuller, seconder, Harvey Benton. <coughs> All those, I'm oh, sorry, any questions? I should have asked that. Sorry, Mr. Fox, before we move in second. Sorry, Mr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't believe that this council should continue to belong to the MAV. The MAV was an organisation when I was a councillor many, many years ago. When communications between Melbourne and our parliamentarians, both federal and state, were difficult. Long distance phone calls that you had to wait for, all of that was gone with the internet. And I don't believe that we should any longer be a member. I made a little scratch uh, uh, cost, and I'm suggesting that um, every time we go to a meeting, to an MAV meeting, it costs around about $2,000. If in fact, we go to four uh, meetings a year, well, it's $8,000 a year. And unless somebody can convince me of the benefit for the expenditure, um, I'm totally opposed to continuing as a member. I don't even know uh, what the membership fee is, which would be in addition to the figures I've given you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Fox. Um, it, just on a short answer, and one of my other uh, CMT staff members may be able to answer that better than, than what I uh, have. Um, out of the 70, is there 76 councils, Ken? 79 councils throughout Victoria, I would say that 90% of them are members of the MAV and obviously do get together to see how councils can perform better. Sorry? All of them. So uh, to me it is a good thing. I might throw to uh, Councillor Clark in you, as he has been a, a member of the MAV and uh, for the last two years representing us at the MAV as, uh, as the Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Certainly, um, participation is something that we need, and we need advocacy with government, and the MAV is certainly the, the, uh, the vehicle for that to happen. Uh, if we're not a member, then I, I would believe that, that we would be missing out on things that are happening. Um, we do have um, meetings, yes, in Melbourne, uh, but 79 councils, uh, nearly all represented at, the, at those state council meetings, and um, there's a lot of discussion about how they can advocate for better things for local government. So I certainly believe that we need to be a member of the uh, Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, thank you. I'll just go back into the movement for that was uh, Councillor Fuller, seconded by Harvey Benton. Uh, any other uh, talk from us, Councillor?
Council is here. Harold Bond. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the MAV do a lot of training, and I've been a recipient of uh, training on many occasions with the MAV, and that's just one small part of what they do. It's a very, very important role. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Russells. So I'll, uh, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. I'll move on to uh, corporate services, 13.1 uh, licensing and licensing. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, leasing and licensing policy um, came out for consultation previously. Uh, and a draft policy was endorsed by council to proceed with that consultation. Um, a number of affected organisations did contact council to provide feedback. Um, and as a result, a second draft of the policy was attached for council's consideration. Just to note that the main um, updates based on the community feedback we received were um, amendments to the definition of the categories of the community organisations which determine their charges um, and the provision of further details in relation to maintenance and insurance responsibilities. Um, so the recommendation is that council approves the leasing and licensing policy which has been amended following community consultation arising from the period of public exhibition. Thank you Sarah. Any questions from the gallery? Uh, councillors, can I have someone to move that motion? <coughs> Councillor Clark and Councillor Fitzpatrick. Any discussion, Councillor Clark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is something that uh, we've badly been lacking for some time. There's some clarity as to how we approach our licensing and leasing uh, policy. Uh, it's been out of hop, and uh, certainly we do need to do something to bring things into order. There have been some small uh, rises in, in the cost to sporting clubs and community organisations, but they're very minor and I think that uh, um, they're still looked after and this licensing policy will make sure that um, we look at it on a regular basis. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Anybody further? I'll put the motion up for a vote. All those in favour? Motion is carried. 13.2, Sarah, advisory order. Uh, thank you. So um, this is for council to provide the outcome of the expressions of interest and make recommendations for the membership of council's audit advisory committee following one of our standard um, standing members' um, expiration of their first term. Um, recommendation is not yet on the screen. Keep going. Yep, uh, so I'll just refer to the recommendation on the screen and ask for a councillor to please nominate the chosen replacement member. Uh, nomination of. Who was that nominating? Was that Councillor Curry, was it? Oh, sorry. It's, no, no. It's not just to nominate the, the person holding the first before we go into um, the nomination. That's fine. Okay, as part of the motion, first we'll go to questions from the gallery. There are none. Well, I have pleasure in uh, recommending that uh, Council reappoint Gail Lee as a uh, member of the Audit Committee. Gail has served her time and uh, is a very active and, and participating member of that Audit Committee. And, um, I was very pleased to see her renominate, so I'm quite happy for that nomination. Okay. So, can we have someone to move that motion of Councillor Clark's? Oh, that's a motion. A seconder. Yes, Councillor Curry. Anybody like to talk from the gallery on that? Apart from what Ken has already spoken. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Thirteen point three. Thank you. Um, so this report is presented to council to communicate council's performance against the council plan for quarter two of this financial year. And the recommendation is that Council receives the Council Plan of what you will see in 2018-19 Progress Report and the Council Plan Measures Report. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions from the gallery on that? Okay. Can I have a, uh, a mover of that? Sorry, there is Brian Fox. Again, please come up. Thank you. Just turn 
it off. Yep, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some concerns about the council plan in that I repeatedly hear about us making Wangara a bike-friendly city. Well, we've done it before and it didn't work. So how is we going to make it work this time? And I suggest to anybody and everybody, if they just wish to go to the top of Merriwar Park, you will find a building there. It's an exceptional building. And it has eight lockable cubicles to put your bike in. And after you've ridden your bike and you've locked it in there, then you can get in the shower. There's a, there's a shower. And there's a row of bike racks outside. Well, I'm suggesting to you, I haven't been down there today, but I go down frequently to check, and I've never, ever seen a bike in a cubicle. In fact, I would reckon about three times a month I see a bike outside locked onto the bike rack. So why would we spend money on more bikes? I mean, if we double the amount, if you double nothing, you've still got nothing. And that's what we've got now. So uh, I, I would like to see the planners use a little common sense. Go and count the bikes that ride up, up on the street and see if they're going to quadruple them. And if you multiply nothing by four, you'll still get nothing. I thank you. Uh, this is question time. And so what was the question at the end of the day, Mr. Fox? It was to ask councillors to reconsider or think about that. Yes, my question, my question is that the, that the emphasis on bicycle participation within the city be somehow um, uh, less to the fore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, through the Mayor, thanks Brian for your question. I, I think our experience when we've done consultation on things like the CBD Master Plan, uh, Tourism and Economic Development Strategies and previous council plans, that there is a very strong emphasis by people on wanting both better pedestrian and bicycle access, both around the city and more broadly around the municipality. And we do have, I, I don't know the data, but we do have quite a bit of data, for example, from counters on the rail trail and other key cycling pathways. So. Uh, we do we do have some understanding of the number of bicycles that are using the bicycle network as it exists and we do have a number of key strategies that suggest we should continue to promote cycling and walking and, and access for those things for people um, we will at the same time we have our draft budget out uh, in about april we will also have the draft council plan out again and um, Yourself and others are certainly welcome to make your thoughts known about those things when that draft plan is out for comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, 15, please. Infrastructure services. Oh, sorry, have you got one more? Oh, the quarterly finance report. Sorry, 13.4. Um, oh, sorry. Point of order, point of order, you know. I haven't, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm uh, starting to get uh, down to the the nitty gritty of the meeting and uh, I'm running away with it. So, uh, uh, can I have a mover of that, please? <coughs> Councillor Fuller and Councillor Ben. Would anybody like to talk on the matter? No? All those in favour of the motion? The motion is carried, thank you. So we are up to 15.1 uh, now. We'll still go 13.4, I've still crossed it out. Sorry. I'm ahead of myself. Right. Continue. Continue on, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is the quarterly financial report that ends up to the period ending 31st of December 2018 for this financial year, where we were within, we were within um, 2% variance of the revised budget that was recently um, discussed at the previous council meeting. And so the recommendation is that council notes the quarterly financial report for the period ending 31st of December. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Any comment from the, uh, from the gallery, please? No, thank you. Um, can I have a mover of that, please? Was that you, Councillor Curry? <coughs> Councillor Curry, a second to Councillor Fuller. Would anybody like to talk on that, please? No, okay, that's fine. All those in favour of the motion? The motion is carried, thank you. 
Now, are we right to go on with it, 15.1 now? 15.1, uh, infrastructure services, the organics processing plan construction. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mayor. So this report is presented to Council to consider the evaluation of tenders for the organics processing plan. This has been a really unusual and long project for us. Um, it started some six years ago, or over six years ago, when the council, prior to the administrators, included the uh, consideration of the organics processing plan in the waste management strategy, and we've been working on it ever since. It's unusual in, in that we had to um, go out to tender for a operating system for the uh, plan before we had uh, the EPA approval. So to get that EPA works approval in place, we had to have the system locked down. So we awarded a contract to uh, Moore Systems, which is an American firm, um, to provide all the technical component uh, a few years ago now. And we then had to work through the EPA works approval process, which took uh, three attempts um, over a couple of years. We got that in place. Uh, they did place some additional conditions on us, on us but we got there. Um, during that, that time, we also were recognised as a potential site to become a regional organics processing facility. So um, um, this allowed us to gain a grant of some $500,000 from the state to assist us with the construction of this plan. To date, we've had uh, three major components already completed. We had the, that first tender for the uh, technical equipment from Moore. We had uh, the provision of electric, electricity and the clearing of the site. When the site was cleared, um, all the timber there was used for firewood, the heads and uh, the roots of the trees were all mulched. And then the third part was the civil works. So that's all the earthworks. Um, it's quite a massive site out there and that includes a 1.3 megalitre uh, contact water basin. So all that work is complete. This tender is mainly about the concrete and the, the sheets. So uh, massive areas of concrete, including seven bunkers that measure 25 metres by eight metres, uh, the, the receival shed and the admin facility. So this will bring the plant up to operational status. Again, it's a little bit unusual that we don't have yet reached a final price with our preferred contractor. We've been working with the preferred contractor to reduce the price and we've uh, done that on a number of items. There's one more that we're working on and both parties agree that the price can uh, come down a little bit more. So we're not declaring the price today while we negotiate with, the, uh, with that contractor. And that means we can, uh, once we reach that uh, decision within the next week or so, we can get on with the uh, project without any further delay. So the recommendation is on the screen. I won't read it all, but in short, it uh, recognises Browns Wangaratta as a preferred tenderer. Um, it authorises officers, officers to continue to negotiate the final price. Um, it requires officers to bring back a bit more detail to the councils on business case. They updated business case and some sources of additional funding. Um, approves a maximum allocation in next year's budget of the figure on the screen, which is about 1.4 million. That comes out of the waste reserve. It authorises the CEO to award the, uh, the, the tender at a later stage to up to a maximum lump sum amount, which is included in the confidential attachment and authorise the CEO to sign those documents, etc. And uh, at a later con uh, council meeting, disclose the contract price. So normally we disclose the contract price once council have uh, awarded the contract at uh, the meeting. Since we haven't got that final price yet, we'll declare that price at the next uh, ordinary meeting of council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Is there any questions from the gallery? Mr Fox, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I note in this recommendation, point number three, request officers to revise the business case and review possible additional funding and present to council. I have closely followed, Mr. Mayor, the machinations over our new uh, UB pool at the Bar Reserve. Never ever did I see an, an item such as this that requests the officers to revise the business case. We have increased the, uh, the uh, uh, 
expenditure deals with who, just like that at the last meeting, and uh, there nobody but nobody has given us an idea of how we're going to pay that money back. So I'm, I'm saying to you, sir, uh, why have we put it in here when council can do what they like whenever they like? I thank you. I'm not sure whether there's a question there for me to answer at this point, Mr. Fox. So. Um, well, I think I need, need clarification. Um, yes, I need clarification. Yeah. And clarification on the item at hand, this is not to do with the swimming pool, this is to do with the uh, organics plant and not the pool. Without mentioning the pool, we have previous, on previous occasions come up with a motion to increase the expenditure of a project by four million. And there has been no, con no, 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 like there is on number three. So if you can tell me why we're doing it now and why we didn't do it historically, I'd be delighted. So I, I think in the case of, of the uh, business case, the organics, it has, um, changed a number of times and it's changed uh, for a lot of reasons but one of which was the um, the price we we're paying for the processing at the moment so uh, when we did the first business case of this we we're paying 134 dollars a ton plus freight uh, to ship it and to process the organics uh, that made our payback period very short um, we when a new player came on the field at Stanhope, we were able to reduce that uh, cost by more than half. So we're now paying um, about $56 a tonne plus transport. So that obviously greatly changed the business case. Um, there's been other things that change it, such as uh, potentially become a regional facility, clearly changes that um, some um, potential agreements with other councils that changes the cash flow dramatically. So there is a need to uh, uh, continually update that, uh, that business model in this case. Whereas um, the business case on the uh, project that we're not allowed to talk about, um, that, that's not an income um, making project at all, as there is a recreation facility for council. So two quite different projects to compare. So I think that's, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Any further questions from the gallery there? Tom? Did you want to ask a question? You raised your hand before. Thank you. Just come and state your name and uh, on the microphone. Thank you. It's on. Uh, my question is uh, just about the uh, procedures for the meeting. I actually got a, ran off a copy of the uh, procedures for question time. It clearly says, and I was. Uh, spoken to you quite sternly last year, you're allowed two questions. Uh, John, and, um, can, can, can I just interrupt you for a second? Fox has asked three already. Yes, no, no. He, he's allowed to ask questions on items. When we come to public question time at the end, we, we've said two questions. No, well, that wasn't the procedure last year because uh, Mr Fox, I, I thought that was the procedure. You could ask a question during the, the agenda. Each item. But I, I'd already asked one, and uh, I was wanting to ask... Uh, two in the normal question time, I wasn't allowed. I was only allowed to have one extra one. That's why I was a little bit upset at the time because I, I prepared for two questions. Perhaps that did happen. Thank you, John, but I'd, uh, I will allow two question times in public question time and will allow, maybe there was a fault there at some stage. Okay, any more questions in relation to the organics? Okay, do we have a movement? Councillor Clark? I'd like to move the recommendation, Mr Chairman. Yes, thank you, Councillor Clark as a mover, seconder. Uh, Councillor Bussell? Oh, Councillor Clark. Clark. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I fully support the letting of the contract for the construction of the construct, concrete receiving pad, the covered space and the storage bins that are needed for, for the breaking down of the waste. So I support this motion in its entirety. But what disturbs me, Mr Mayor, is that 
for two years as the Mayor of the City, I was continually provided a construction figure of 11.9 million for the aquatic centre of the meeting. And not once did any officer suggest to me that the cost had escalated by some four million. Just three weeks ago, my namesake, Alan Clark, told us, both in this room and the one next door, that the cost of construction in the aquatic centre could not be compared to the CPI increases and were more in the order of 7 to 8 per cent. And the escalation in steel and concrete prices were the real reasons for the cost blowout. Just last Monday evening, not this week but last week, was the first time that councils have heard about the cost increase in the tender price for this portion of the organic plant. I refer to page 7 of 25 of the confidential report for today's meeting. The shortfall is made up of additional EPA requirements, CFA and fire protection, legal advice after the budget process. Really, why didn't officers ask them for additional funds? Councillors have enough meetings regarding finance and a budget review, and I cannot recall ever hearing that this plant could cost another couple of million dollars. We're also told that an unprecedented, unprecedented increase in construction costs in the past 12 to 18 months, particularly steel and concrete, which make up a large portion of this project. So again, Mr. Mayor, we're presented with a massive increase in the project costs. As I said in an email a few days ago to a senior officer, I've lost confidence in the ability of officers making presentations that are accurate accurate and factual. I wonder if we're not employing robots, because I'm sure that when Councillor Curry sits down with his managers, the first thing that would, would be to ascertain any cost increases that are likely to happen with the project. Accounts prepare cash flows and estimations on a regular basis, and I know whilst we try to get a near a break-even point, we still in conjunction with the client ensure we're accounting for changes in money values and costs. Obviously not so with Council. This project has been on the drawing board and we've heard Mr Clark say it since 2014 and I cannot ever believe that there's been a, an increase in the construction cost put into any budget that we've seen. I politely ask for a line by line copy of the financials, 350 pages or so, as I wanted to carry out checks on all the line items within, and we'll do so, so each month until I'm satisfied that my community can be confident with our performance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll use the right of reply if someone else speaks. Um, Brendan McGrath. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm not at all intending to enter into the debate, but I would like to just make a couple of comments to reassure uh, councillors around our process. Um, all I can really say, um, that there is a number of reasons outlined in the report um, why costs have increased more than anticipated. Um, our staff do their very best to estimate projects accurately and in 99% of cases um, they do that very well. Occasionally when we go to the market, as we have had two recent examples of, the market comes back with a price that is different to what we estimated the cost would be and there isn't a lot we can do about that. Um, we do the best we can to provide the most accurate estimates that we can. Um, the market prices will be what the market prices are at that point in time. Um, we did provide some uh, independent documentation that verified what uh, Director Clark said about increases in steel and concrete and therefore construction costs recently. Um, and all we can do now is do our very best to negotiate the price down as low as we can. Uh, Councillor Curry. I might actually have, have to ask Brendan for clarification on this, but um, my name was, was used then, and, and Ken's right. I, I would sit down with my managers and ask them if there was any cost buyers. But there is a difference. If I'm going to a board, I'll already go out and I will ask for a quote. My managers would be expected to get a price and a price beforehand. It's different in local government. So, what these guys do is they can't, and this is a bit that I need clarification, you can't go and ask for a tender before you do the budget. You come up with the best estimates you can, and then you go out to tender post that point in time. 
There is a difference in that there's legal obligations that change between local government and private commercial worlds. So yes, there will be changes, and obviously we would expect the, the CMT team to do their best due diligence, but, I mean, but there is going to be, until you actually go to the market and actually ask for the price, you can't commit 100% that that will be the price. So can you please just clarify that for us? Thanks, uh, Councillor Curry. Uh, I guess if we're talking about buying a standard off-the-shelf product, like a you know a vehicle or a particular piece of equipment, we can do lots of we can get lots of really accurate information around what the cost is likely to be by you know looking at websites and, and doing normal things. When we're talking about a, a fairly complex project like building an aquatic facility um, or an organics processing plant, as we are here. Um, Builders spend um, in the thousands and thousands of dollars uh, putting a tender together to respond to a request for quote. So um, we would never ask a business to do that unless we were pretty certain that the project was going ahead. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult to get contractors to give you a, an accurate indication of the cost of these things until they've got the tender documents. What we do do, however, uh, is we rely on uh, disciplines like architects and quantity surveyors who see tenders and projects day in day out right across the state to provide us with very accurate estimates around uh, building costs, earth moving costs, electrical costs and all of those things based on recent and current examples of similar tender projects. So those are typically the sorts of information we rely on to, to put together the, the budget bids and the business cases for those more complex projects. Uh, thank you, Brendan. And before going back to Ken, I just have a question to put forward to, I'll see you, Harry, then. Uh, back to Alan. In this tender process on both those projects, uh, Alan, we just didn't get one tender to decide on. So obviously we were, we had three or four tenders on, on each and all similar in their pricing. So with the pool, we'd um, gone out to expressions of interest and had seven. We've then invited seven firms to tender. We had five come back to us, and there was a bit of variance in the pool or aquatics tender, yes. With the organics, we had three tenders, and they're all very close, which seems to indicate that it's a, a fair market price. Thank you, Alan. Harry? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is quite a unique facility where we turn green garden waste and uh, organic matter into something that looks a bit like potting mix. And uh, so I can understand why there's some variances in cost because it's not an off the shop plant. It's something that's quite unique and uh, arguably an amazing uh, facility here in Wangaro that could be in the future a commercial business. So I'm happy to support. Councillor Fitzpatrick. Yeah, can I just say that no, our staff are not robots, they are human. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Councillor Clark, you're right, reply. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As I said, I'm concerned that we as councillors may be shirking our responsibility by accepting all that is presented to us, usually without questions. And this council will now be asking all the questions on the day. Or I'm prepared to accept any proposition in the future. I may not point at the last meeting about our long-term financial position and trust it will be addressed sooner rather than later. But I would ask for you, as the Mayor and the Spokesman, to let the ratepayers know that the costing for the Organic Centre has increased by at least one and a half million dollars on the figure being previously broadcast. We need the organics plant for saving money, but I think ratepayers are entitled to be told for the increase in costs and more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will not confirm any of that because a price hasn't been decided on yet. Thank you. So I'll put the motion forward. All those in favour of carrying the motion? The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, the Waste Policy Charge 2019, 15.2 on our agenda item. Thank you, Alan. So thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So this report's uh, presented to Council to consider placing the Waste Charge Policy 2019 out on public exhibition. The Waste Charge Policy doesn't talk about the actual fees in waste, but it talks about how we apply the fees. So we bring it to Council every year just prior to the budget. Um, this year there has been um, a number of changes. They're all relatively small and included in the report. The largest one is uh, to allow us uh, to complete the introduction of green organics uh, to a, a few additional locations within the municipality, which is currently being trials occurring. It uh, clarifies um, a few things which were already in the plan, including um, how many wineers, commercial businesses can have, um, the maximum tonnage is that will be received at transfer stations. Uh, exemptions for unoccupied commercial buildings and one, one fairly new area I suppose is the um, extension of the four strike policy so there's um, <coughs> been a four strike policy in the uh, waste charge policy for some time and that's about contamination in, in recycling bins but as of 1 July, there's going to be state laws come into place which uh, bans e-waste going into landfill. So anything with a power cord, battery, can't go into landfill. So the changes in the policy this time uh, will help us enforce what the state are enforcing on us. And the final one is um, uh, really just clarifies something that's already in our local law, and that's about all bins having to be re removed from the footpath within 24 hours. So today we're asking that uh, Council uh, essentially place the draft policy on public exhibition for 21 days, uh, establishes a special committee if required, reports back to the uh, ordinary Council meeting on 16th of April if required, and if no submissions are received, then that they consider the uh, policy adopted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Any questions from the gallery, please? Anne. go on to our wonderful Rule 2 quick site, it takes you a minimum of five clicks to find that local law number one if you actually know what you're looking for. So the local law is number one, it's actually called local law number one community amenity, but it predominantly brings up local law number one policies. So is it possible to change the wording in the draft document to reflect that if you were trying to search for I'm sure we can do that, Anne. Uh, I think you've had a question about this policy every year. So, uh, you know, and they've all been good inclusions, so we can have a look at that. Thank you. Um, and when are you proposing to implement the organics um, collections to Glen Rowan, Hamilton Park, Oxley, Miller? It's not really clear in, in the policy change. No, well, the policy allows us to introduce the, those fees, but it doesn't uh, talk about a date. Um, we're doing the trials at the moment, but um, I think we're looking at September, but I may be wrong there. That's fine. Um, and also, uh, how is the council going to communicate the new introduction of the e-waste contamination for the bins? So, there'll be a lot of communication right across uh, Victoria with this. So, um, we're hoping to a large extent to feed off some of the TV advertising that will, will occur, but we'll be doing our own uh, campaign internally. That on, and also let you know that he's resigned. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Are there any other questions from the gallery in relation to this item? No. I'll put it back to Council. Can I have a mover, please, for this Council of Enter and Council of Fuller to Seconded? 
Any uh, advice from council here? Any comment? No? All those in favour of this motion? The motion is carried. Uh, Alan, 15.3, Wangaratta, Eldorado Road, Burke Road, intersection reconstruction. Thank you. So this report is brought to council to consider the awarding of the contract for the Wangaratta, Eldorado Road, Burke Road intersection. So uh, this is the intersection that feeds into one of our major heavy industrial sites. It's uh, poorly designed, it's uh, constantly failing, failing uh, largely due to uh, very poor drainage. It's in a very low spot there, and also the amount of heavy vehicles turning there. So we've um, had a design done that uh, encompasses about 200 metres of that road and the intersection. Uh, we're fortunate to have received uh, a grant of over $700,000 to help us with this work, which nearly covers the entire cost of the uh, project. So the recommendation is to award that contract to a lock on excavations, authorise the CEO to sign and seal the documents and disclose the contract price once uh, we've resolved. So. Uh, thank you, Alan. Any questions from the gallery over this intersection and sealing this road? No. I'll bring the council. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, Harvey Benton and Councillor Curry to second it. Any comment, please? Yes, Mr Mayor, I think this has been a long time overdue and if it's really something that will push the industrial area out there. There's been a, a road situation there on the intersection of Burke and the Road Road so heavy vehicles getting into the industrial site. has been a contentious issue for some time and seeing that we've been able to secure the, the grant funding that's uh, urgent to be done as quick as possible. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Any other councillor for a reply? Okay, all those in favour of the motion? And the motion is carried. And Mr Mayor, the contract price is $758,709.24, excluding GST. Uh, thank you very much, Alan Clark. Uh, development services, um, Items number 16, 16.1 is an the application for a use of land for an animal boarding facility. Stephen Swart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you said, this is an application for an animal boarding facility. It's at 1070 Wangaratta Woodfield Road. Um, the proposed facility uh, will op operate within an existing shed located on the land and the land is within the farming zone, which is about two kilometers west of Oxley, um, next to the Oxley Primary School. Um, at the moment, the land's got an existing dwelling and multiple sheds, so the proposal is to use one of those sheds for this use. Um, the boarding facility is proposed to accommodate a maximum of eight dogs. Um, notice of the application was given and a number of uh, objections were received through that process. We also referred the application to a few authorities. Um, we've considered all that information, including the provisions of the planning scheme, and are recommending that council issue a notice of decision to grant a permit subject to conditions, and those conditions are available in the report as an attachment. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Before I throw it open to the gallery to ask questions, I do have a number of questions from people who have uh, put their questions forward earlier on at council. Um, and if those people are here today, did they want to read their questions themselves or are they happy for me to read their questions for them? So, for example, I have Billy Buckridge. Are you happy to read or do you want me to do your questions for you? I'm happy to read. You're happy to read? Uh, Cameron Miller. Cameron Miller here today? No, yeah, yeah. No, you can read them. I'll read your question. Thanks, Cameron. Um, Ruth Noble, uh, Hill Noble. Yes, I You're happy to read yours, thanks, Ruth. And Robin. Yes, I'll read yours too. And the last one is in no relation to that. Okay. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll just read Cameron uh, Miller's questions first. Dear Council, I'd like the following. Sorry, before I read these questions. Um, I'll, I'll then ask for question time after this for anyone who didn't submit questions. Uh, then those questions may already be answered in the questions coming forward. So if, if that's the case, there's uh, there'd be no need to stand up and ask. Uh, dear Council, I would like the following two questions tabled at February 19th Council meeting. Question one, 
Given the applicant's willingness, letter dated the 28th of October 2018, as part of the application, for the applicant to include a condition setting a noise level to be to be at the nearest dwelling, why has this condition not been put forward as part of the planning recommendation? That's the first question. Second question is given the application stated that grooming will only be provided to dogs boarding at the facility, why is there no condition attached to the application to mitigate the amount of traffic noise and potential escape that will come from such a service being offered to conventional dogs? So we'll get those questions answered first. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So when it comes to the first question about uh, noise standards and EPA standards, um, in the conditions or the proposed conditions of the, the permit that's attached to the report, we refer to um, EPA standards in a broader sense. So that defines noise um, and applies noise broader than just the one dwelling. We thought that would be a, a better way to deal with noise. Um, and would more efficiently deal with noise in this case. Question two is about the grooming of dogs. So the application talks about the grooming of dogs that are boarding at the facility. The application is not to um, groom dogs that aren't boarding at the, the facility. So that would be a separate um, activity or use of land potentially um, and may trigger a planning permit. So. Um, if somebody wanted to do that on the land, we'd have to talk to them about the uh, requirements of the planning scheme and whether they need a, a separate permit for that. Thank you, Stephen. Um, two more questions to Council's Rural City of Wangaratta from Robin Snowden. Thank you, Robin. Question one, how is the Council going to enforce that the proposed animal boarding facility be used for service dogs only? And question two, who will be the impartial person that monitors the number of dogs at the facility at any given time? Thank you, so question one, which is about um, restricting it to service dogs only. The proposed planning permit conditions do not restrict this activity to service dogs only. It, um, the, the permit is for eight dogs in total. The reason for that is we've made an assessment of imposing such a condition. We don't feel, we don't think that condition is enforceable and um, would be very hard to administer. And therefore the, the permit is for um, eight dogs in general. Um, and um, that, that's the limit that's been put on to the planning permit conditions. In terms of question two, which is around who will be following up um, on you know, compliance with the conditions. Um, the short answer there is that council would be the front line there. Council is the res responsible authority when it comes to administering the planning scheme and planning permits and associated conditions. However, when it comes to issues like noise, for instance, we do work with other authorities like the EPA. Um, so we'll work with other authorities in that space. Thank you, Stephen. We do have our enforcement officers that, that can go onto properties and inspect at certain times. Absolutely, yes. Okay, I'll now move on to Ruth. Ruth Hill Noble, are you yes. ready to come? And the microphone's already on, Ruth, thank you. Processing plant was acceptable to the EPA. Um, 
and you keep referring to the EPA, so perhaps this is something that's terribly important. We need to take on board. The EPA recognises that dogs are a problem. Um, and there is no limit to what sort of dogs. My second question, if the local residents or the school community in close proximity to these proposed boarding kennels find the noise levels or animal behaviours excessive, with whom do they safely and securely lodge their complaints and know that they will be acted upon? Thanks, Stephen. So when it comes to point uh, question one about EP, EPA noise guidelines, um, our response to that is that we did consider the EPA noise guidelines. They are guidelines and not standards, so uh, they, they guide how um, these things should be considered. Um, and when they refer to residential areas, they um, define those as uh, the type of residential areas that you find in an urban environment. Um, this area is, around, is in the farming zone, um, so that uh, puts, I suppose, a, a slightly different lens on it. Um, in terms of the 500 meter buffer area. In terms of question, or oh, and just back to the noise issue, we did include a number of conditions in the proposed planning permit conditions, which, which you can see in the attachments to try and manage noise. Um, a lot of that relates to the way the shed will be um, upgraded to try and manage noise, um, insulation of that, that shed walls, the way the ventilation system works, and so and, there, and there's a few others in there as well so definitely included a number of conditions to try and manage that um, in terms of question two where do you come to complain if this becomes an issue to complain if this becomes an issue uh, again council is the responsible authority for administering the planning scheme and we would be the first point in, of contact in that space as i said before we will also work with other relevant authorities as and if required. Um, it's through the mayor. If I could just add, I think the other part of your second question referred to safely and securely lodging complaints. Mm. Um, just to let you know that complaints uh, are treated confidentially. We don't disclose the name of complainants when we go out to look at whether enforcement action is required or not. So uh, those would be treated confidentially. Um, no, this is your time to ask questions on this matter, but you can ask questions in public question time on other issues relating to council, etc. But if it's in relation to this issue, if you have another question, please please yes. raise that now. May I? Yes. Um, because a planning permit goes with the land, not the owners, wouldn't it be appropriate for council to be considering the long-term ramifications of a general dog boarding facility so close to residences and primary school rather than a specialist dog facility in the short term. This area is completely surrounded by houses. It doesn't matter whether it's zoned farmland, it's still residential, rural residential area. It doesn't matter what label you put on it, there are a lot of houses and a school right next door. So I would ask you to please consider that it is a general dog boarding facility that we're talking about and we need to look at that from a long term point of view. So that's my question. Can we consider it as a long term rather than short term specialist dogs? The application was considered exactly in that light. So it was considered as a general uh, boarding facility for animals, so dogs in this case, um, a maximum up to eight. Um, the fact that it's specialist dogs that, that might be housed in this facility um, wasn't specifically considered as part of this application because the applic or the, the permit, if it gets issued, goes with the land. Um, and therefore we did consider the longer term ramifications of such a, a land use in that area. Stephen, the conditions on that permit also go with the land? Yes, so um, as long as the permit is active, the conditions will be active as well, and they are enforceable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Billy, did you want to hop up now? Okay. Please, thank you. Um, 
Billy Buckreach, and I am the next door neighbor to the Capitiolos at 1086 Wang Redwood Hill Road. My first question is, the subject premises are presently training dogs for life. Why does the council not issue a license to operate the business, alleviating, alleviating the need for a permit, which goes with the land? All the management, code of practice, and EPA standards and the building requirements must still be adhered to, therefore. Second question, the dogs for life is being espoused as the basis for the kennel application. Council in its own admission states, the permit will be granted for any person to operate the facility and the permit runs with the land. How does council propose to monitor the EPA breaches or will it now be the neighbor's responsibility to report and report breaches? Thanks, David. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the first question, uh, I guess from our perspective, we have to look at what permits are triggered under the planning scheme. So in this case, a permit is triggered under the planning scheme for this type of facility. Um, we don't have the ability to issue a license under the Planning and Environment Act. We simply have to um, assess the planning permit application um, as it's submitted to us, go through a process with, um, um, I suppose, notice and advertising of, of the application and talking to referral authorities and then recommending a decision within a specific time frame. So we don't have that ability to issue a, a license as you mentioned that. Um, we, we are considering a planning permit. Um, in addition to the planning permit, there will be a need, if they are successful this, with this planning permit, there will still be a need for them to um, re, uh, get a domestic animal business registration through council and there will be requirements on that as well. But that, again, is not, not considered a license. So we have to consider the, the planning permit on its own at the moment. Um, in terms of question two, which I've sort of answered before about compliance and how we follow that up. We do have a planning compliance um, a resource within council and uh, the specific job of that person is to follow up on these types of matters. Should people or should people or applicants not comply with their planning permit conditions, that's exactly what we will follow up. Well, is, am I? Yes, oh, keep going, please. The one problem that my husband and I have, as some of the other neighbors have, is the close proximity to our residences. And I did a lot of homework with the local kennels that are in the Shire. And Kilowara Kennels is 200 meters with two neighbors. One of them actually is a relative, so is actually associated with the Kilowara Kennels. Apple Tree has a 500 meter buffer with one neighbor and the Hume Highway. Casira has 300 meter, it's a farm area and there's only one neighbor affected. Kelly Country is two kilometers and Kabala is 800 meters with two neighbors. So we are very much affected by the close proximity to this kennel. Eight dogs regardless. And it's very concerning that can find animals and we're very much attuned to what happens with dogs. And I know that they're doing the dogs for life, but unfortunately the permit is not specifically targeted dogs for life. It's a general, general uh, permit and therefore potentially could be anything. And there, the one thing I would like to know is if something is amended, if a permit is amended, how difficult is that? What is that process? Same. So in terms of amending a planning permit, um, it pretty much, pretty much goes through the same process again, um, especially in this case where we've had uh, a number of objections to this. If we did get an application to amend the permit tomorrow, we'd have to go through that, uh, that process again, provide you an opportunity to every site. Well, I thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Um, before I go on to any other questions on this matter, uh, I'd like to thank 
Billy, Robin, Cameron and Ruth for uh, your questions in writing. It certainly helps us to uh, answer those questions as best we possibly can. So thank you for putting them in writing and sending them to council uh, prior to the council meeting today. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions in relation to this before we move forward? Uh, thank you. You can ask those questions during the uh, if the motion gets up. No, I'll ask the questions to clarify in making my decision. So my question. You still have your vote after that, okay. once the motion is put up. Okay, so uh, is there a mover for the motion? Councillor Benton, thank you. And a seconder? I'll second. Councillor Clark, thank you. Um, would councillors like to talk or ask questions on the motion? Councillor Bussell. <laughs> Just following correct meeting procedure, Councillor Bussell. I didn't want Councillor Clark to pull me up. <laughs> So this is the second biggest decision that I've got to make since I've been in council in two and a half years. I'll tell you later what the biggest one is. <laughs> so first I want to thank the objectors for engaging with me and telling me what your concerns or some of your concerns. I really do appreciate that. So then I had a long discussion with planning they've done a lot of work with different building materials to make sure that this is a quiet and secure facility. And Mr Mayor, your attention. Yes, thank you. After that discussion with planning and the extra work that they've done, I'm comfortable to support the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Bustle. Would anybody else like to talk for or against the motion? Thank you, Councillor Clark. Mr. Mayor, I was president of the conciliation meeting. Contrary to correspondence we received, 
I believe that all players were given the opportunity to have their say at that meeting. I do not think the criticism of staff was warranted. And although the person from Dogs for Life was given more time than necessary to present their case, I think that the language was a big factor in that occurring. I was most disturbed by the copies of the letters I received that had been sent to the applicants by the applicant's mother to neighbours. However, the applicant's planning consultant and our own planning department had been more specific as to what was being planned and I think there may have been a more amicable result. I've also been able to observe at close quarters one of the companion dogs trained by the applicant who has been used by the Centre Against Violence in support of children who are needing to attend court proceedings. And let me tell you, this dog has been so well trained that it protects children and its handler like no other dog I have observed. We continually talk about economic development and here's an opportunity for some economic development. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Apart from you, Harvey, anybody else first before Harvey finishes? Thank you, Councillor Benton. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's only fair that I give my opinions and come to the reason, and I'm a bit like Councillor Bussell, it's probably one of the biggest decisions I've, second ones I'm going to make today as a councillor. However, coming from the, and understanding the farming zone, and if we take our memories back a couple of years ago, there was a, a great hell of a little about the feedlotting down around a, a, a residential area near Yay caused a, a tremendous upheaval through the planning scheme. This is a farming zone and we've got to tie it and we can't alter that. We can have other farming activities there that possibly would cause more disturbance to the local residents. And I do sympathise with you there, but the problem is that's what it is. And then until we change that farming zone to something else, and that's going to come from pressure from the community to want to change that to low residential. We've got to deal with the, plum, with the land as it is, the act as it is, and it's a farming zone. The ramifications for this not to be able to go forward, I think, are going to give immense for the farming zone to have the right to farm, which I'm very, very aware of, and I know the people on all sides of the argument are too. So therefore, Mr. Mayor, I'm supporting the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Ben. So I'll put the recommendation forward if there's no more. All those in favour of um, approving the recommendation? The motion is carried. Thank you very much for that. So I'll move on to 16.4, uh, 16.2, uh, use of land for extra industry expansion of existing quarry. Thank you, Stephen Ford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is an application for an extractive industry um, on land at number 233 Ivone Lane in Middlewa. Um, the, the subject sand is, uh, land is located approximately 4 kilometres northeast of the township of Middlewa and also 4 kilometres kilom west of the township of Everton. Sorry. Um, the extraction area is under contract to Anson Eidelberg and the nearest wearing, wedding knot in the same ownership is about one kilometre away from the proposed activity area. Uh, the land is also in the farming zone and also affected by um, some overlays. Um, the proposal was advertised and a number of object objections were lodged against it. Um, and we also referred the application to referral authorities. Um, we considered all that information that we received um, from objectors and referral authorities uh, and the applicant against the provisions of the planning scheme. And at an officer's level, we are recommending that council issue a notice of decision to grant the, the planning permit subject to, to conditions as you can see in the attachment. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Before I throw it open to the floor for any questions, uh, I do have some questions here by certain people, um, uh, and I'm happy to read those questions, or very happy for those um, people to come up and read those questions. So I have from Bernard Mo Mooney. Is Bernard here today? Did you want to read those questions, Bernard, yourself, or are you happy for me to? Great, thank you, Bernard. Um, we also have Paul and Wendy Hardy. 
is Paul and went here. Did you happy to read those, Paul? Thanks, Paul. Um, and David Davenport, did you want me to read those, David? I'll oh, read them, thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, so I'll start that. Thank you. The I'll just leave you to last, David, if that's okay. Uh, David, your email on behalf of Linda Sikorsky, you're happy for, for me to read that one? Oh, but Bernard, sorry. Sorry. You're happy for me to read the question on behalf of Linda Sikorsky, uh, or is Linda here? Uh, her sister is here. Her, her sister. Yeah, just, just one moment, I'll, I'll, I'll get you up shortly to read that. Thank you. I would like you to. Okay, yes, yeah, I can do that. Uh, I've, got, got I've got the copy now too, oh, sorry. I, no, I just saw the... Obviously, I've got one on Melissa McDevitt, uh, and she's obviously not here. Hi. Melissa, oh, you are. So, sorry, Melissa, would you like to read yours or happy to meet her? You'd like to read it, great. Okay, so the first one is. He's on behalf of. Uh, from the estate of Nancy Sikorsky. Sikora. Sikora, sorry. Yes. Sikora. Sikora. Do councillors realise that the proposed levies will cause flood, flood water to back up onto our property as our house floor is only a few centimetres off the flood of the 1993 flood level? And do the councillors realise that my parents fought for several years to have levies removed from the old works? To have them reinstated is a serious problem for this house. Thank you again. Um, so just on that, um, I guess I'll just explain a little bit of our process when we deal with planning permit applications, especially applications of this nature where they become very technical. Um, our process includes referring um, this application off to a number of authorities who are the experts in their fields and have staff with specific expertise to deal with these matters. Um, in this case, we referred the application off to the Northeast Catchment Management Authority, who are the floodplain managers for this area. Um, they have had a look at the application ask for a number of permit conditions to be put on the permit if it should be issued and part of that is to actually um, construct levies around the proposed pit site um, they didn't raise any objections to the proposal um, and, and seem satisfied that those off-site impacts um, would be minimal Thank you, Stephen. I wrote to the councillors questioning if they have any knowledge of the neighbouring properties working with these pioneers to have work done on the levees, whether it was to have them taken out or altered on sections of the eastern pit. I believe this was fought for due to the de uh, destruction that changes due to the speed and course of the water was doing to these properties. If they proceed to going back to permitting levies on the floodplain, I believe this would be a backward step and really don't consider council is honestly knowledgeable with the flooding issue uh, that affects us. Um, this is still a, sorry, this is a continuation from Nancy. It's just new, came from Nancy's sister. We haven't got a copy. No, we haven't got a copy of that, just came here. Um, so the floor of our dwelling is only centimetres, which I answered in that, which was uh, done in that previous question. Uh, I believe that minor variations caused by levies could have serious impacts for us, particularly the practice of levies and quarries in, in repetitive. I feel the limited flood study does not appear to allow for innumerable flood circumstances. Floods always vary immensely in their duration, swiftness and course. If the councillors decide at this meeting that if some questions have been reasonably addressed, 
I believe a vote to defer the decision should be made. It appears that the heritage legislation was altered within a day after the heritage rules changed. Stephen. So I just wanted to clarify a question. So the first part of that question was about flooding in impacts and potential flooding impacts, which I've already answered uh, previously. The second part was about heritage rules changing. Yes, the heritage legislation was altered within a day after the state heritage rules changed. I'm going to have to get clarity on that. I'm, I'm not sure what that refers to. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Just through the through the mayor, further to Stephen's comments, there are instances where the state government does make changes to the state provisions in the planning scheme, and, and they can have virtually immediate effect as opposed to changes that we want to make to local elements of the planning scheme, which take many, many months, and in some cases a year or more. So at the end of the day, the state does actually control every council's planning scheme, and they can put provisions in place that can take immediate or almost immediate effect. Whether that was the case with what's been referred to here or not, we would need to check. Uh, thank you. Bernard Mooney, uh, Mooney sorry, has two questions for today's meeting. Do councillors believe, question one, do councillors believe they fully understand the impact of permanent levies on the floodplain of neighbouring properties? Question two, do councillors believe that using proposed fish farm, which is not as yet approved, is a legitimate foil to permit council to not consider that the land is permanent lost to agriculture? So. Thank you. Um, so the first um, question I, I'd answer in a very similar way uh, that I did before. We depend um, on the Northeast Catchment Management Authority who are the experts in this field to provide us with advice. They've had a chance to look at this planning permit application. They um, considered all the information that was made available to them, including the assessments of uh, the way water moves across that property and provided us with their response, including asking for conditions to be put on the permit if it should get issued, and didn't raise any direct objections to the proposed um, application. The second one, in terms of uh, fish farm, um, I guess just to clarify, there hasn't been an application with us for fish farm, farm on this property. We considered an application for extractive industry. Um, I, I can only assume it refers to what this pit might look like once this use ceases, ceases and that is um, that it would be a pit filled with water um, and re rehabilitated. Um, in terms of the agricultural um, value of the land, I think the assessment when you read through it in the officer's report, you'll see that that point is covered on, in, a, in, on a number, number of, in a number of places around um, the quality of the land and recognizing that there's a certain certain quality to the land from an agricultural point of view but we also have to consider that against the benefits of uh, of having this extractive industry in this place and um, what that land use would look like in the future it's acknowledged in the officer's report that agriculture could continue on the rest of the site apart from the activity area and once the activity ceases in a number of years that that um, pit filled with water may be a resource to ag agriculture on this on this property. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, some questions from Paul and Wendy Hardy. Question one: Do councillors understand that uh, there appears to be no binding methods of keeping quarry trucks off the dirt road, which is Ivones Lane? If the council should decide to improve the load rating of the bridge to take the trucks and affects up to six households along Ivones Lane. It's question number one. And question number two, we ask the council should consider the water quality issues raised over Hanson's test showing substantial water quality impact at a distance of 600 to 800 metres. And then our private test four months later showing the problem clearing after the quarry ceased. So in terms of question one, uh, in terms of access to the property, the permit conditions as they stand, if the permit should be issued, um, allows access from the Markwood Tarawindi Road and not from the Ivans Road um, or Ivans Lane area. 
Um, so in terms of the operation of this site, if the permit should be granted, that would be the access point is the Mahputara Ridge Road. If um, they don't use that access point, that would be a breach of the conditions of this permit and obviously that would become an enforcement issue for us as a council to follow up. If in the future the applicant decides that they actually want to amend their planning permit to um, access the site from Ivan's Lane, that would be an amended planning permit process and we'd have to go through a process with neighbours and <coughs> referral authority to, to get to an answer in that case. In terms of water quality, again, uh, my answer is very similar around the process that we follow. We referred this application off to Goulburn Murray Water. They are the authority that looks after water quality in rural areas. They, their response was for us to include a number of conditions on the planning permit should the, the permit be issued and did not raise any objections to the specific proposal. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I'll now refer across to uh, Melissa McDivitt. Do you want to get up and uh, please talk, Melissa? Thank you. <coughs> Melissa, could you just press the little speaking man on the front there and... Uh, no? Oh, where it says press here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Hi, um, my name is Melissa McDevitt. I'm an elder of the Warrawoo and Yorta Yorta peoples. I'm a descendant by blood from Peggy um, and her daughter Jenny McCullum, and from the they were from the Wang Wangaratta and Benalla areas. Um, I actually have two questions that I'd like to ask. Uh, the first one was. Uh, were First Nations consulted and did they give, um, were they given an informed, did they give informed consent in support of the quarry project? And the second question is, why hasn't a CHMP been done to satisfy the cultural heritage concerns of the First Nations peoples? including the registered Aboriginal parties established under the Aboriginal Heritage Act. Stephen, thank you. Thanks. Um, under the uh, regulations and provisions that we follow to determine the process for planning permit applications, um, we do look at the Aboriginal Heritage Act and the requirements of that act. Um, this area was looked at and um, assessed as not within an area of cultural heritage sensitivity and therefore uh, a cultural heritage management plan was not required for um, this process. Um, I, I have had a number of conversations with um, different people and was under the understanding that you could actually request one even if it wasn't triggered. That's true, a voluntary cultural heritage management plan could be done in certain circumstances. That's entirely up to the um, applicant. Um, and in this case, uh, that was not submitted, submitted as part of this application. Okay, so Pat, I would like to think that I could, um, the council could consider um, deferring um, their decision so that we, we, the First Nations people could seek legal advice in respect to this proposal. Um, that comes down to council laws to make that decision, and that could take period. The, could the um, you could always apply, I suppose, later without uh, being a legal representative for an injunction against this planning permit if that was to be the case. Uh, if it was to get up and go through, then you could apply for that at a, at a later time. Perhaps, I'm not 100% sure, but Stephen might have further notice on that. I might just again talk about the process here. So, um, <coughs> if a uh, notice to grant the, the permit uh, is agreed to tonight by councillors, there is a further process that could be followed to challenge that decision through the uh, Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Um, so that's the next stop um, if uh, somebody chooses to challenge that decision, if that's the, the decision that's coming out of tonight's meeting. 
For this one, there was no um, requirement for us to go through that process, um, and uh, we've assessed the process based on that information. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Davenport. <coughs> It's on that. Oh, you just turned it off. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Good. Thank you for taking the time for this. I wanted to give you a preamble before I ask my questions because I wanted to put it in a, a correct context to some degree. So, um, Council's primary aim is to represent local people and issues and provide support for their ratepayers and inhabitants. This is morphed to some degree as federal and state governments shunt more and more of their responsibilities onto local government while increasing the number of statutes, authorities and laws they must consider before making any discussion. Council is now by necessity a government body bound by all the laws and governings of their overseeing state and federal governments. The councils are the human touch between their ever berating constituency and the bureaucracy that constrains them. It is this human touch I'll appeal to. The economic considerations, the legalities, the countless authorities involved and the reports they have submitted <coughs> um, are now on record for good or worse. What you as councillors are now obliged to do is decide what you feel is best for your constituents, their prosperity, their wellness, their safety and their future. It is on these grounds I appeal in the name of common good and common sense to heed the objections I've made in my submission to Council against the granting of this uh, mining licence. <coughs> um, question one. Is Council aware of the rescinding of the lease arrangement covering the crusher site at Tarawinji? Unless there are plans to relocate it within the Rural Council of Wangaratta, all processing would be performed probably at Hanson's Howlong Crusher effectively negating any economic benefit within this shire. I <clears throat> go on, and you probably, I'm not sure how many of you have copies of this, but I can quote them. With relation to clause 21.04-1 floodplains, clause 21.05-1 rural land and agriculture, clause 21.05-2 water, Clause 35.07, farming zone, points 2, 3 and 4. Points 4, 8 and 13 of appropriate decision guidelines. Paragraph 2, regional context. Paragraphs 1 and 2, council plan strategy. Paragraphs 5 and 6, assessment. And paragraph 1, conclusions and recommendations. My question is, if Council cannot guarantee the first class protection of prime farmland and the water table within the Ovens Valley, how can it justify the passing of this permit to its constituents? Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, so, question one, um, I guess if the, if the question is if um, at an officer's level we've been uh, aware of lease arrangements covering, covering the crash at Tarawindji coming to an end? Uh, the simple answer is no. Um, I would go on to say that uh, when it comes to the planning permit application, that wasn't part of what we would consider. So we would consider the application on, in front of us, which was for an extractive industry on a specific site. Um, it was not based on the fact that you know the, the, the material would be processed in a certain location. And in terms of the economic benefit, um, if that is the case, that if material is processed not within the council, um, you know there is um, some provisions within the, the planning scheme, including some of the provisions that you list there, 
uh, under regional context that talks about the benefits of having construction material available to the construction industry uh, in a broader sense. a lot of other things too that don't include that. Is that a, another question? So my, the, the point that I was getting to is that um, even though there's a lot of provisions that we have to consider within the planning scheme, there are regulations and um, statutory um, rules that we have to also consider that's outside of the planning scheme, including codes of con conduct. Our role as officers is to consider all of that information, including objections from, from the public and residents and what we get from referral authorities and make a recommendation on balance. So we have to try and balance all of these things out. In terms of agricultural quality of the land and protecting prime farmland, um, I think I've illustrated through my previous answers that through this process we did consider that very carefully and um, our conclusion is that um, on balance again there might be a small area that's being taken out of agricultural production but will produce something else um, into the economy and then the rest of the land would still be available for agriculture and the future form of the pit once this activity ceases um, could contribute to, to agricultural, agricultural activity in this area. Uh, thank you Stephen. Uh, to Bernard, David, Melissa, Paul and Wendy and Linda, thank you for your um, questions in writing. We do appreciate that here at council level. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor in relation to this matter? Okay, there's a few. Okay, we'll start at the front. Madam, could you, this is you, Madam here. Yes, please. Could you please come forward, uh, press the little uh, man speaking voice on there, state your name for council records, please. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Rebecca Crawley. I'm the um, honorary CEO of the Fitteroa Waveroo Nations um, Aboriginal Corporation. Um, I've come here today with Melissa McDevitt, I'm um, the Chancellor of Cultural Heritage Management. Um, one of the things I think I just wanted to uh, raise and ask the Council about is that given that this area has traditionally been an area that hasn't had a lot of history in terms of Aboriginal history, um, we have some difficulties knowing whose country is whose country and that type of thing up here. And as far as Aboriginal heritage, um, goes there hasn't been a lot for this area in itself so if you have a look at the overlays for this area you'll find that it's generally just along the waterways that, that you if you look at that at the moment we're actually through the treaty process we're involved in a lot of the um, gathering of historical evidence and the truth telling and a lot of the information that um, we engaged historians at the moment we found some information regarding to Mary Jane Mellower <coughs> I think you might know. I think that there's a bronze bust being made for her at the moment in your in your shire. Um, we believe that Mary Jane Millowell was actually living in that area around the Ovens River there, and um, just because it hasn't been identified at this stage as a cultural heritage site, we believe that it potentially is. So I suppose the question as councillors given the lack of information that we have in this area and the lack of cultural heritage that's been done in this area. How do you um, look at historical evidence and oral histories also relating to that area? So is that a question for the councillors that you say? It's a question for the councillors as well in terms of uh, it's probably something that hasn't been posed before, but just in terms of, and how also that affects the decision making for um, potential site like this. Yeah. Can, can I just ask you a question in return? Why hasn't there been done any work on this land over the last 10, 20 years? Why, why does it all of a sudden come to a point when a planning application is lodged? So uh, if, yeah, sure. if can that question, the lady so. from Millowa, yeah. um, is of great significance, wouldn't it have been imperative to do that uh, over the last X amount of years? So, um, as Melissa McDevitt said, it's very difficult to even know which this particular site, which rap it falls under. So, registered Aboriginal parties can do this, but for an organisation such as us who do not have a rap, so we're not reg registered by the government as being an Aboriginal party, not recognised, 
we don't actually have the capacity to be able to make these things happen and do the research ourselves. It's only through this treaty process that's happening now that we actually have the funding to be able to access this information. So we're going down that process at the moment. So it's a really good question about how it hasn't been done before, but there just hasn't been the capacity for Aboriginal organisations to be able to do that. Yep. Anybody else like to uh, talk from, from Council on that matter? Stephen, could you address the question? Thank you. Um, again, you know, as officers, we are tasked with looking at a permit application based on the requirements of um, legislation at that moment. So in this case, you know, we made a determination that a cultural heritage management plan is not required before a planning permit application is uh, potentially decided on yet. Um, as I said before, there is the ability for uh, the applicant to do a voluntary cultural heritage management plan and work with the registered Aboriginal party and other interested parties as well in that space. They also have an obligation under Aboriginal, the Aboriginal Heritage Act to ensure that there's no disturbance of cultural sites or artifacts and re report those discover discoveries. So there's, there is an ability to informally work together even outside of uh, the specific requirements. But when it comes to our assessment, we, we very much focus on what are the requirements of law at that moment in time. So just a follow up question then. Um, have the applicants had any training in recognising Aboriginal artefacts and what sort of process do you have in your per permits for making sure that happens as well? I guess the only answer I can give is I don't know whether they've had training in recognising these things and there are no con uh, conditions or requirements proposed for this specific permit um, based on the fact that um, the requirements are that no cultural heritage management plan is needed at this point in time. Great, thank you. Uh, Angus. Just state your name for the record, please. Angus Calder, I'm the applicant, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors. Uh, this has been a very rigorous process, as you're aware, and I am very much aware of the, uh, of the opponent. Um, but one of the issues that I would like to raise and also ask uh, the opinion of the council, earlier today, there was reference to the increased costs in, uh, in the construction of the swimming pool, a uh, recycling site, uh, concrete and steel. Uh, during this process, which began in April of last year, um, we became aware that uh, Hanson were going to run out of resource in uh, around November, December last year. They informed us that as a component of that, that they would be forced to begin trucking material from over the border in New South Wales, and that the likely uh, cost to that was going to be an increase in uh, concrete costs in the local area of 15 to 20 per cent. I don't think it should come as any surprise to councillors that that's suddenly showed up in the, uh, in the budgets that you're now seeing for these buildings. But it also would be very honest for council and the community that everyone be made aware that it is now cheaper to buy uh, concrete out of uh, Albury by companies like Baxter than to cut it down again. Dude, I saw Baxter trucks in the main street of, uh, of the city on Saturday morning. Um, this is something that Hanson are very much aware of. There is only two concrete suppliers in uh, Wayne Grader. Uh, Country Concrete and Mawson's are both the same company, uh, sourced from the same site, and uh, Hanson. Hanson, therefore, are uh, removed from the game by the fact that uh, it's now almost a monopoly in concrete in this town. And the end result is that the increase in prices that, uh, that this council is seeing on just these two projects will also flow through into all other developments that are taking place on behalf of the council regionally and for any private development, including residential developments and business. We are arguably regarded as having some of the most expensive concrete in Victoria in Langrada, and that is a situation that this, uh, this application is seeking to address, and I think it's a very important one. Council uh, is here to represent 28,000 uh, citizens of this, uh, this sort of uh, area, the city area, 
and not just uh, the components around the area of the pit. I don't particularly want a pit for my back garden either, but the process that's been gone through here is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the flood modelling alone cost over three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, you know the impacts uh, of all of these things have been addressed. I don't want any problems any more than any of my neighbours want one. Um, but it, it appears to be something that's very important to this council, and I certainly hope that you'll take that into account. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angus. Uh, yes, sir. Just state your name, sir, and <coughs> thank um, you. My name's Terry Rees. Um, no, no use of position for me to be in, but um, so I'm here. But, um, I'd just like to ask a question um, about the quarry, or the proposed quarry. How many years is it going, going to last? Oh, stop. Oh, let's start. <laughs> So um, that information is not provided in the material that I have with me, but uh, typically, you know, this is a long-term prospect. So um, <coughs> the, uh, the applicant um, put a um, three-quarter page advert in the paper a few months ago, and he also said on there that he um, has earmarked pockets of land for future mining, so it says on this, um, paper here. So when you put this permit through, you'll be putting another permit through for the other pockets he's allocated? That's a possibility. Um, Anybody is able to make an application for um, any type of use and development under the planning scheme. We would consider each application on its merits uh, when we receive it. Uh, we talked about running out of material for Hanson, but um, I haven't had any material there for about six months. I could be corrected, but um, I don't think those pits have been operating for six months. So I obviously have got material elsewhere. And I do know there are um, other quarries around the area which I used to take fuel to when they were making the freeway around um, Glenrung, right behind Mawson's, and um, another one just opposite um, McCullum, which aren't hardly used. So there is material in the area if everyone wants them, wants to um, go and get it, and also they could probably find other quarries around the area as well, I dare say. So don't be um, misled about um, having a pit in your own backyard. There's plenty of um, stone in those hills out there, so there's already quarries out there. <coughs> and um, just two seconds of this. Oh yeah, and um, there's, um, hasn't probably been a permit granted in a floodplain for around um, seven to 10 years. I just hope um, the council here don't go tearing down the wrong track and doing something that they might regret later on. You've only got one shot at this. Once you take away all that agricultural land, put it in a hole, whether it's um, five foot deep or 20 foot deep, it's a hole, not going to be ever used again. And you say we have a fish farm there, maybe in the future. So um, it says on here we have a fish farm. But um, <coughs> there's no running water in there, those um, <coughs> red line holes. I'm not sure how he's going to do it. But um, if you're going to a fish farm, you do need running water to um, keep the fish healthy and things, whatever you do. And um, when you feed fish, you feed them protein, and protein is generally meat. So um, half of that, or a tiny bit of that, will fall to the bottom. Fish actually um, have excrement, they will fall to the bottom will actually pollute our water. So when you say there's going to be other farming activities in the area, it might not happen. So um, just don't um, pin your hat on other farming activity in a, um, a dam, such a thing. Because it just says in the paper it's going to be a commercial activity, so there'll be a lot of fish. Cornbridge would eat them all anyway. <laughs> so good that was just a statement, I suppose you have to answer if you want. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Yes. It's question time, so thank you, Terry. Did that's that's all you've got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nobody else from the floor. Yes, madam. Just please state your name, madam.
of gardens lane and the Pelham's Road, the entrance, front exit to quarry is probably about less than a kilometre from where we are. Now, we were also impacted by polluted water, but being a woman, I didn't correlate it to come from the quarry. In fact, I was too busy setting it into a filtration system whereby the water was drinkable. My quest first question is, does Hanson have any future strategies should other people or us be impacted by pollution in the future? In terms of a response to that, um, I guess the short answer is again, we, we don't know they have uh, strategies for longer term monitoring of, of water quality. I would uh, maybe turn my answer to a different aspect, which I've already covered a, a few times, which um, relates to the authorities that are responsible for these areas. So in the case of water quality in this area, the responsible authority would be Golden Murray Water. They have been involved in this process and haven't raised any objections. Um, there could be many factors um, that could impact on water quality um, and that is for them to consider at that point in time. My second question is, I've been informed that Hanson were willing to limit the loads to five loads per day, which to me doesn't even seem fiscally viable. However, this morning, and I'm probably being very cynical, but at approximately 10.45, the truck and trailer loaded, non-tarped, <coughs> went up Darden's Lane and over a bridge with a 20 tonne limit, and I personally would not went on on that bridge. So is this going to be a strategy to avoid going past the homes of many of the objectors? Because by turning right there, and then right again, down the factory road, they can arrive only a few hundred metres from the crusher. So um, the planning permit application uh, provides some information about how to access the site or how they would want to access the site. Um, a specific proposal to access the site of the Markwood Road, which is a sealed road instead of off uh, Ivan's Lane, which is not a sealed road. And there's also a bridge in Ivan's Lane with capacity issues. Um, there is, if this planning permit does get issued, uh, one of the proposed planning permit uh, conditions relates to the number of truck movements, and it is uh, five a day. So it's been restricted in that way to try and manage um, any adverse uh, impacts from truck movements as well. So how would that be policed? So this will get policed just like any other planning permit condition. Um, the council is the responsible authority for uh, enforcing planning permit conditions. And if we become aware that um, people aren't complying with the planning permit conditions, we would take enforcement action. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Mayor, just a point of clarification. Yes, there are an enormous number, uh, number of trucks uh, in the area, both on the Great Alpine Road and uh, uh, our side of the uh, Millawa side at the moment. They are all being operated by NECMA on an enormous um, repair project on the Owens River. That's um, been taking place now between Everett and Tarawinji. That's right. Mm. Thank you. This truck did emanate from the quarry, though. Not, mm. not really all right. Order there. So I'll now... Um, Put it to councillors for somebody to move the motion and start discussion that way. Can we have a mover, please? Councillor Benton, thank you. And Councillor Curry, seconder. Councillor Benton, did you want to talk first? Did you, would you like to talk? Close debate. Close debate, thank you. Does anybody else like to uh, talk on behalf of this? Councillor Bustle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Good to see you. That's great. This is a 
most difficult decision that I've had to make. The last one was the second most, as I said. <laughs> I've met and listened to four objectors, and I certainly thank them for that. And they raise some good fair points, I think. I must say, all the people that I've met with have been very respectful to that's uh, that's uh, I appreciated that in the discussion. I read lots of documents, reports, looked at maps until it's been done to death here. So I have to say, Mr. Mayor, if I vote with my heart, I will vote no. And if I vote with my head, I will support the recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bussell. Would anybody else like to talk further on the motion before I round off with Councillor Benton? Councillor Curry? I must admit I know very little about the exact rules and regulations and whenever I'm in doubt, I've got to go to the authorities and the authorities have been very clear in this particular point with their resolutions about what they've done with the permit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. No one, Councillor Clark. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll be opposing the recommendation. I would reason the many, not the least of what the continued extraction of gravel, gravel is going to do to the water table on a known floodplain. It's beyond comprehension. And, um, you know, NETMA in 2014 refused the permit to allow the expansion of the quarry. Uh, now, Look at the events in, in December 2018, with NECMA being responsible for those creeks and streams. We've now got a massive clean up, and we've got farmers who are suffering because of um, the lack of maintenance and, and lack of uh, indication of what was to happen in the area. So I'm opposing it. Thank you for your thoughts, Councillor Benton then. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. As Councillor Curry has said, it's one of the most difficult decisions I've had to come to terms with in trying to get some comfort in going forward. And talking to you on both sides of the argument, I've had great difficulty becoming to a point where I'm just comfortable with to proceed. I know I moved the motion, I moved it to the start of the vote. But I am going to say that I'm not going to support the uh, recommendation on several reasons and I have in, outlined to the applicant if I did make them when I got to the decision I would give you my reasons. The reasons going forward are very convoluted in my opinion in the way that this is going to be managed in the future. It refers to the code of conduct for low miners. The low mining or low minimum risk mines and in reading that document it gets down to about two parts of that document and it particularly relates to groundwater that I'm greatly concerned with moving forward. And it has to be that the pervious layer in that area out there does the water transverse very quickly. You've only got to hear when you let water out of the Buffalo Dam how much gets to Wangaratta and where it disappears along the way. We have documentation since 1972 about water and I can never for the love of me why NECMA have not put in bores to maintain some of the, the uh, water quality to see whether the actual or factual or whatever it is. Nobody seems to know. Murray Golden Water have got a document out that says about and in this thing scantly reports about water groundwater movement. They only refer to bores being used to recover some of the material. They don't talk about any of the movement of the groundwater in that area. We know that that happens because you've got dra nearly got drag line holes everywhere out there. And one of the most important things we've got around here is water. And at the moment, by Christ, it would be great to be out and around the Markwood area, to, in my area, because that's about all I, I haven't got any out where I am. So going forward, I can understand the, the, the need for the product and in principle though I can understand having a quarry. I've been through personally this over in my lifetime with quarries on my own family property and the determination but it was the end of the day that has really spun me away. How are we going to enforce it? We've got a thing called the licensee in the code of conduct, code of practice. Who is the licensee? The applicant? Hanson's? It's not very clear 
who is the actual licensee going to be? Because that's the person that gets back to Earth resources. And both sides of the argument have come to me and have said the cleanup plan of the existing pre um, pro actions out there has not been very satisfactory. But it gets back to the Earth resources of the ones that are going to control this by reading that document this morning is going to be the one to enforce it, to come back to council to enforce their, their actions. And I think it's not very helpful when we have such a convoluted effort to try it. Although I think that we, the staff here have done a magnificent job to try and get around it and keep going. We've got 50, 50 recommendations and conditions in the permit. But I'm still not satisfied that at the end of the day, all things are going to be able to be cared for. How the depth is five metres, how do you measure underwater? Now let's face it, Miners will take an extra shovel full, an extra truckload because they're running short that week. Next week you're in at your eight metres underwater. If you're only going to go five metres and stick to it, but it's going to be covered with water, even the NACMA says it will be impacted by groundwater before it gets to five metres. So there's got to be pumping going to have to be done to be able to know where you're going to be. Going forward, in relationship to that, even NACMA says it's going to be impacted by floods, but they want a metre, they want a metre. Levy bank put around it. What the hell for? Because it's going to get washed away in the first flood. But it's going to be there for perpetuity. Because everybody that's going to own that plot of land has got to maintain that levy bank. But they don't do anything about monitoring bores. And they've done bore monitoring and neck. They've got the, the ability to do it. Because they do it out around my area in relation to salinity. They've been doing it for years. Why don't they do it in this area? It's the mere... That's the reasoning that I put forward that I will not be supporting the motion. Thank you, Councillor. Mm -hmm. On that case, I'll put the motion forward to councillors. All those in favour of the motion, please, please raise their hands. The motion is carried. Oh, a division, please. A division is called. Make a note of who said no and who said yes. People who raised their hands or who said yes to the motion. And those against, please raise. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll move on, Stephen. Uh, David, would you please? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just reiterating my conflict of interest regarding my work relationship with the applicants. I'll leave the room now. So, keys to get back through the door. Uh, thank you, 16.3, uh, planning application for a 10 lot subdivision, 485 Wangaratta, Yarrawonga Road, Waldara. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is an application for a 10 lot subdivision um, at 485 Wangaratta, Yarrawonga Road in Waldara. It's uh, land located in the low density residential zone and the proposal is to create 10 lots ranging in size from 4,000 square metres to 4,650 square metres. Um, part of the application is to create a um, new road of about 330 metres in length, running the full length of the, the, the site, uh, and uh, the, the road will access Calgay Drive, or Calgay Drive. Um, the application was uh, advertised in October, and uh, a number of objections were received against it. Um, we also referred this application to a number of, of referral authorities, considered all of that information and the provisions of the planning scheme as it applies to the site, and at the officer's level we are recommending um, that a notice of decision be issued to grant the planning permit, uh, planning permit uh, subject to conditions, and the conditions are attached to the report. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Are there any questions from the gallery, please? Yes, Ross. Come and state your name in the uh, microphone, Ross. Most of the people here might know you. That's it. Help story. Yeah, Ross Meads. Um, I live in Tobago, opposite Tobago's Lot One. Um, 
I'll be there for the 28 years. And seen lots of brave things come and go over that time. Um, my main concern is the, the drainage um, problem in the whole Wagara area hasn't actually been able to be as such. I know that they've got a lot of studies. And I'm um, just wondering what, what the council does have proposed to address uh, the drainage problem overall in the Wagara area. And will I keep the residents informed of the progress? Good question, Ross. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, and Alan, sorry, Alan. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ross. Um, there's works occurring this year, so I think you're aware there's been studies of the, the drainage in that area have been completed. Uh, there's money in the budget this year to uh, improve the downstream end. Um, this is where uh, the major gains can be uh, had. So um, we're going to do some works or free up the water movement and allow it to get out of that area faster. So we're going to do works um, on Old School Road this year, uh, greatly in increasing the capacity of water to get uh, under and potentially over Old School Road. There is another piece of uh, work that's budgeted this year and that probably won't occur and that's on private land. It's doing some bunding to uh, restrict the water movement. That's not going to have any imp impact on people as upstream as far as you are though. So the important works are the ones that we are going to do this year, and it should free up that water movement. There's other smaller gains to be made, but uh, which which we don't have budgeted at the moment, but that'll be the big one. Ross, just one more question. Yes, please. Um, a lot of the problem occurring in Port Tarbell Drive is the uh, western end of it, the Narrow Road, uh, well, Wangaratta Road end. Um, a lot of the water comes from the golf course flows across uh, through underneath the um the Aronga Wing Road. I was just wondering, is it possible to look at some works to to mitigate or to to divert that water somehow so that maybe people know how quickly if you do divert it or if it is diverted, it will cause a problem for someone else further downstream, probably in the, the Ashley Drive mm. area. Is is that a possibility at all? Alan so of course it's a possibility. I'm not sure of the actual facts off the top of my head, so I'll have to go and have a look at what's been done in the past and what solutions have been proposed, but um, I'm not sure of those right now, Ross, so I'll have to come back to you with it. Thanks, Ross. Yes, sir. Hey, my name's Wayne Delarue. I, uh, I'm in Ada in Telgate Drive. I bought uh, four of the boundary properties in the new subdivision. So, and the runoff water that currently runs through the swales is a large drain that runs through my property, Ada in Telgate, which goes through the neighbouring property and out into the reserve and then disperses. So I am very concerned that the extra, extra water it's going to come from hard water runoff and tank overflow. It's, it's flowing through our property and the neighbouring property and into the reserve. So Sharon and I have lived out there for 12 years and we've seen significant rainfall, which is from what the properties are now. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, the water is going to increase and flood into our property. That's what's one of my major concerns. Okay. As well as with what Ross said, yep. diverting some water. So Ross has lived there a lot longer than we have, of course. And the flooding of actual blocks that are in the subdivision have been flooded as well, so to a significant level. Okay, thank you. So when it comes to the drainage of this specific uh, development, so the 10 lots that will be created by this permit if it gets issued, um, it would be a requirement that uh, um, drainage discharge from the site would be no greater than pre-development levels. So that's you know a, a starting point for us, and that it will impose no further load limit on surrounding drainage systems. At the start of the application, um, the applicant provided some information about how drainage would be dealt with on site, um, and as part of the proposed planning permit conditions. 
will require further information, um, including detailed modeling and civil plans to try and um, demonstrate how the flow through the land will be um, managed over time. Yeah, also another point I'd like to raise is the drainage or culverts that are in the, uh, the, the driveways of the houses in Telgate Drive. Is that, is that going to be uh, an upgrade that the landholder has to do or is cancelled or the subdivider going to upgrade those to cope with the extra water? So that seems to re re relate to, um, I suppose, the broader area and the drainage in the broader area. I don't know if you have an answer to that. Probably not a, a, a full answer now. It depends how that work, if there indeed is upgrade work done on the, on the drive. Um, and if council was doing upgrade work right through there, then I would think that uh, we would be doing those driveways. But, um, if it's uh, just done in a more general sense, then, then it would be up to the individuals. Um, so but we can't give you the specifics. We know we've got issues there. There's been issues there for a long time and it probably goes back to the original developments and, and what was approved then. So it's hard to fix some of these things retrospectively. Um, I think our plan at the moment is to, to do this first piece of work, um, see how that impacts on, on, on the whole area, and, and then go from there. Yeah, I, I, like I've seen overlay a picture of the actual drainage, and there's a drain that runs down the boundary fence line, and that's going to meet right where my driveway is, yeah. and the water's not going to be able to escape, so it's going to have to go somewhere where there's pushback down on the road, and like Ross point before where we probably need to exhaust some of that water down into across the golf course and down into the creek which would help the help, help the whole situation I think I believe. Yeah, just keep in mind with air plans that you've seen at the moment their concepts before they can commence work they yeah. have to provide detailed plans that meet all of our requirements so uh, yeah. not obviously get scrutinised well and truly doesn't necessarily, this development doesn't necessarily take into account the, the golf course, so the golf course is on the upstream side, and so we will be looking at the impact of this development on the drainage. No worries. Great, thanks, Wayne. Any question? Any other questions from the gallery? Yeah. Yes, Ross. Go on. Just, just one more point, if I may. On page 89 of the council report, in the second paragraph on the drainage, it does say. Um, They submit this work was only to consist of upgrades to existing driveway crossovers. This such work is not being the responsibility of council. So to me, I would read that if we require to upgrade our crossovers to cater for this increased water flow due to the increased subdivisions, then it's the landowner's responsibility, the cost. Just in that second paragraph, page 89. I think in general terms, Ross, if, um, if council does something that impacts on someone else's property or, or in this case the crossovers, then generally uh, we, we do the work. It's a generalisation now. I can't be specific on every situation, but um, for instance, when we were just uh, constructing the Springhurst Boreman Road, we put new culverts in at the gateways to, to um, properties because we'd altered the road and the, and the drains. Um, so if we are causing the changes or making the changes, generally we, we'd be doing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any more questions from the gallery? Uh, thank you. Well, I'll put the most, sorry, ma'am? Yeah. No. Sorry. sorry. Um, Councillor Buss, would you like to move this motion? Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a second to vote? Councillor Curry. Um, Councillor Bussell, did you want to talk first on the motion? Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this decision's been easy in the last couple, so uh, I have uh, faith in the uh, planning department that they, with the detailed plans that they will, uh, or the infrastructure department will, um, do a good job there. They're uh, normally very, very conservative, so uh, this will be a great project to tidy up this fire hazard paddock out there, the entrance to Wayne Granite and uh, I look forward to uh, the drainage issues being resolved to your, your standard and uh, 
some more development we agree. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Would anybody else like to talk for or against the development on council? No? Nothing further on Councillor Bustle? I'll put the motion forward. All those in favour of the motion, the motion is carried. So 18.1 and 19.1, we will uh, handle together on these reports. Thank you, Chair. 18.1 uh, 18 uh, is asking Council to endorse minutes of four meetings of about advisory committees, Economic Development, Sport and Rec, um, Agriculture and Arts, Culture and Heritage Advisory Committees. 19.1 uh, is asking councillors to endorse a number of Assembly of Councillor records which relate to meetings between November and early February this year. Uh, thank you. Any questions from the gallery? No, thank you. I'll put the motion to, sorry, Councillor Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Councillor Clark, would you second the motion? Are there any any? Uh, Anyone talking on the motion? No? I'll put the motion uh, forward. Sorry, did you want to talk or are you just in favour? <laughs> All those in favour of carrying the motion. Thank you, the motion is carried. I'll turn over the page uh, 20 says no uh, notice of the motion and urgent business. It's public question time. So I am uh, happy to take two questions from any one person. Uh, continue on from where, Councillor. Uh, Clark has left off in the past and my previous meetings here too. Is there any questions from the gallery? Mr. Fox, please step forward. I think you've been asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm probably a bit late in the day, however, I've had a chance to read the, um, the financial statement from the last financial year of the council. And one thing that stood out to me was that the, uh, the waste contract with JJ Richards was renegotiated up. Now in my view, a contract is a contract. If China had decided that they were going to pay more for recyclable waste, would we have had a review of the contract with JJ Richards? I believe that we were, they were taking the waste. If their um, contract with the next level wasn't working for them, well, that's their problem, not ours. I don't see how the contract can be negotiated up. Can anybody answer that? Too? Yes, Mr. Box, thank you. Um, Alan Clark, please. I can. In principle, I agree with you. We shouldn't be paying more just because uh, they're not getting their return. But in this case, because it was a worldwide situation, um, if contracts hadn't been renegotiated, then all of these recycling contractors would have gone uh, broke and we would have been left with no recycling happening in Australia. It was under that uh, situation where the, the minister uh, gave exemptions right across Victoria for councils to renegotiate uh, contracts without following the normal um, processes dictated in the Act. So we negotiated a, um, what I believe was a very good result for this uh, council, considerably less uh, uh, dollars per tonne than any other council. So I think we got a good result. 
and in doing so we kept uh, that contractor alive and in as a result the, uh, the the sorting facility or the MRF which is located in Wangaratta continues to operate today. If we hadn't made those changes and that facility would have closed, we would have had nowhere for our recycling to go. It would have been going into landfill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that response. However, when I travel around this country, I see JJ Richards on the Cold Coast, they're in Caloundra, they're in Brisbane, they're in Sydney, they're everywhere. Well, I don't see how us negotiating with them is going to save them from going broke. We had a contract and I think we should stick to it. And uh, I don't agree with this, but... And I, I think most of uh, council here agree wholeheartedly with you, but uh, you. it was either to, which is a change, <laughs> um, but we, uh, we would have seen rubbish pile up on the street because uh, JJ just, Richards just would have stopped. And then we would have had to sue and continued on from there and it would have been a long process and uh, yeah. everyone would have been thinking of it. don't want to get into debate about this, but if JJ Rich has decided not to pick it up, well, we'll hire another contractor and then send them the bill. Right? A contract is a contract. Anyway, so I'll move on to the next, move on to the next uh, question. Mr. Mayor, I've been trying to promote this council as an very, very important body and get the divide between the community and the council closer and closer. Now, I've had a little bit of success and I'm delighted to see the A-frame out in the street, but I'm not delighted to see when the wind blew it over, somebody took it away and it never came back for three days. Right? There was no A-frame out there yesterday, there was no A-frame out there the day before, but there was one out there today. Right? So, in, in trying to bring, bring the council and the residents closer together, there's another important move. And leadership is by example, not by order. It's all about carrot and not stick. Good soldiers follow a good commander. And I'm asking you, Mr. Mayor, to ask Brendan, would he please put a decal on the side of his car that says he's proud to be the CEO of the rural city of Wangaratta. Because he can't ask another officer to put a decal on their car unless he's got it on his car. And oh. I'm, I'm emphatic about that and, and I would be delighted to see it. I'll, um, I'll ask Brendan regard the question rather than a decal on the car, are you proud to be a resident of Wangaratta without putting a decal on your car? Yes. Uh, that's on video for everyone to see and I think that's noted that he is a proud resident, he lives in the area of Wangaratta and proud to be Wangaratta. I'm proud to be a Wangaratta person as well but I don't put it on my car that I'm proud to be Wangaratta. People know that I am because I live here. Okay. We all live here because we're proud. Uh, I, I, I think that that response, Mr. Mayor, with the deepest respect, is slightly unfair. I think that your car is your car and my car is my car. Uh, Brendan's car is my car. It belongs to the residents, to the city. It doesn't. It's his car. It's part of his package and it is his, his automobile. He can do what he likes with it during his tenure here at Council. Thank you for the answer, sir. And thank you for your question. It's a good question. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? Please, Anne Dunstan, come forward. I started with the staff, and now look what you've done. Yeah, it's always good to hear from you too, Anne. Um, in respect to the decal, I think there's security issues in that, so I respectfully understand why people don't put decals on their vehicles. I don't advertise my business on Great Alpine Road for that reason, so that my clients are not located. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Um, at the November the 20th meeting, we extended the um, consultation period by 60 days for the strategy uh, management CBD master plan for the car parking strategy. I would have anticipated that it possibly came back to tonight's meeting or today's meeting, but I'm really hoping that there was some great responses. I 
think it's down to the next meeting, but there's certainly lots of feedback and um, and there will be changes as a result. Well, I presume there'll be changes as a result of that feedback. So, um, and Thank you, Anne. Um, is there any other questions from the gallery in here? Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, there is no uh, confidential business arising today. So if, uh, if any councillor would like to say anything about anything, I would open the floor to any councillor at the present time. But if not, I'm looking around, there seems to be none. Uh, sorry, Councillor Bustle has always got something to say. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just responding to uh, Mr. Fox's remarks, uh, I'm uh, very happy to follow the leader. Is that me or because uh, <laughs> I've got decals on my car? One anyway. Um, thank you, Councillor Bustle. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in that case, I'll declare the meeting closed. But we appreciate your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Have a great night.